set. All right, it should be recording now. Excellent, thank you, Nina. All right, so quick overview of what we'll be going through today. We'll start off with, as always, welcoming introduction, just so everyone's aware of who's on the call. Um, and then the focus for this working group will really be on reviewing a lot of the work that we've done up till now, and then digging in more deeply on some of the draft recommendations that were included in the version of the report that was sent out last Friday. So I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to understand and um, comment directly on the recommendations that were relevant to this working group specifically, um, as uh, we're uh, planning on incorporating all feedback and comments into the final review round for the report before it goes to the Connecticut legislature in January. So we'll start out by reviewing the working group from deliverables as they were set out in the charter for this working group at the beginning of this initiative. Then we'll review some of the key findings that were surfaced throughout the uh, uh, time that this working group was in place, um, reviewing some of the size and, and other content materials that were presented at past working groups. Then digging into draft recommendations and then finally ending with next steps. So starting out with introductions, uh, my colleague Nina will go down in alphabetical order or whatever order she sees in the Teams group uh, to uh, identify each person who's attending this call. When she identifies your name, please state your name, uh, your title, and the organization that you're representing. Thanks, Colin. All right, I will start. I'm Nina. I'm a senior analyst with Stratagen. Uh, the next one I see in the list is Enrique. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Enrique Walsh, uh, head of corporate innovation at Avantgrid. Nikki. Hi, everyone. Nikki Bruno, vice president of clean technologies within Eversource Energy's gas business. Thank you. Brian. Chris. Chris Capuano, uh, Nell Hydrogen. Aaron. Aaron Child, Strategy and Consulting. Jordan. Jordan Ahern, Intern at Strategy. Adolfo. Adolfo Rivera, Senior Director, Green Hydrogen, Avangrid. Lydia. Hi all, Lydia Rupert, Connecticut Deep. Sam. Hi all, uh, Sam Donowski, she, her, Sierra Clubs, Connecticut. And I'm Shannon Lawn, I'm an attorney and the Connecticut State Director for Conservation Law Foundation. Great, and I just want to flag Colin, um, Brian put his introduction in the chat. Um, and then if there's Excellent. anyone else that I missed, um, can go ahead now, give it a, like a few seconds. Um, Nina, would you be able to read out Brian's intro just for the record? Yeah, of course. Uh, Brian Garcia, president and CEO of Connecticut Green Bank. Thank you. All right, and I think that should be it. So you should be good to go. Excellent. Well, as a reminder, my name is Colin Smith, also with Strategy and Consulting. Now we'll move into uh, the next phase of the um, presentation, looking into the uh, deliverables for this working group as they were laid out in the working group charter. Um, so the key deliverables that were identified for this working group at the beginning of this uh, effort uh, were uh, to develop some geographic analysis detailing the locations of existing infrastructure in Connecticut and its proximity to hydrogen production and offtake sites. Then we were going to develop some high level assessments around the needed infrastructure that could be required 
as part of Connecticut's ongoing efforts to develop a hydrogen ecosystem in the state um, and the associated costs of that infrastructure. Um, and then finally, uh, assessing some of the priority areas for hydrogen infrastructure development, taking into account uh, environmental justice and economic development objectives within the state. So walking through some of the key findings with those deliverables in mind, we can start out with um, some of the geographic analysis that we uh, also presented at the last task force meeting and in various forms at the other working groups and task force meetings uh, developed as part of this effort. Um, but the, the sort of key insight here is that uh, connecting infrastructure will likely be required to transport hydrogen to major off-takers within Connecticut um, when, if a hydrogen is developed in the state at a, a large scale. Um, if we're looking at large scale deliveries and production of hydrogen, you can see here that the likely production zones uh, for hydrogen from uh, major clean energy resources like onshore and offshore wind and solar um, are not necessarily directly uh, connected or, or in very close proximity to some of the major off-takers. You see here on this slide a number of the off-takers or the off-takers that were identified as highest priority within the state of Connecticut. Um, things like peaker plants or power plants, um, airports, uh, shipping ports, um, fueling stations, uh, and major highways for uh, long-haul trucking, um, as well as things like hospitals, high heat manufacturing, um, and data centers that could uh, employ fuel cells or hydrogen to um, provide backup power or uh, primary power for industrial processes. Many of these off-takers are clustered around the center of the state or along the southern coast, um, whereas uh, much of the renewable energy production is uh, focused in the um, northwest or the southeast of the state. Um, there are some opportunities for uh, co-location, primarily in uh, or, or around uh, the areas of Bridgeport and potentially New London. Um, but uh, by and large, it's likely that if the majority of these off-takers were to be served within the state, it would likely require some level of infrastructure development to connect those off-takers with the uh, major production sites. Now, digging a bit more deeply into that geographic analysis and factoring in environmental justice and economic development objectives, you can see there are a number of areas where um, hydrogen infrastructure development, indeed hydrogen industrial development in general, could create opportunities for uh, environmental justice and economic development objectives to be met. You can see a number of major high, potential hydrogen offtakers are located in or near areas that are identified as environmental justice communities or distressed municipalities within the state of Connecticut. Again, um, Bridgeport and New London uh, arises potential areas where both offtake and production are located and also opportunities where uh, there could be um, a chance to either uh, support economic development in an otherwise distressed municipality or uh, improve air quality um, for uh, communities that have traditionally been at the front line of pollution issues. Uh, Colin, you've got a hand from Shannon. Uh, yes, Shannon. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I definitely understand flagging that there could be economic development opportunities in some of these distressed municipalities and EJ communities. Um, but I think there's a tension here with the potential for um, for adding to cumulative siting burdens in these communities if projects were to be sited there. Um, and I, I don't know if that's discussed on a later slide, but I, I think that's worth flagging that um, that there is that tension and maybe some of these communities, you know, might not want to have projects sited when they may already be burdened by energy and industrial infrastructure. This is a really good call, Shannon. Thank you for raising that point, because it's true. Um, if there was uh, large scale hydrogen development in these regions, um, the benefits may uh, be associated with additional siting needs for um, uh, pipelines or potentially hydrogen trucking. Um, questions that would definitely need to be addressed in order to make this transition actually equitable and make sure that, you know, people are uh, being uh, are able to um, benefit from this development and, and not uh, hindered or or having their communities damaged in ways that 
perhaps in the past uh, they were by related energy developments. Um, and we're, we plan to address a number of those concerns in the recommendations. So I, I would reserve discussion, any more discussion on those topics until uh, that, that discussion at the end, if that's all right. Uh, and maybe, Colin, if you wouldn't mind me just chiming in briefly, I think, um, you know, not to um, spoil any cliffhangers, but um, one of the things we're definitely we've been thinking about um, specifically in the recommendations is how we support communities to be able to voice their perspectives and opinions and, and participate in these processes. And so we would love an any feedback that folks have on, um, you know, whether some of those suggestions, recommendations are, are in the right directions, or if there's other things that we might think about to help communities be a part of these conversations. So, Colin, I don't know um, if the recommendations will get into some of those community engagement pieces, but um, yeah, that's a that's a great call out. They will, but also that's one of the reasons why we're um, their draft recommendations and we're putting them in front of everyone on this working group, because if they do admit any important uh, pieces um, related to what Shannon mentioned or any other concerns that other people have front of mind, um, please let us know and we can work to incorporate them into the final recommendations that are sent to the legislature. Um, and Sam, I see that as we've been talking, your your hand came up. Uh, uh, on a related note, um, the potential for increasing NOx emissions um, by combusting hydrogen is um, would be a, a, another uh, issue we'd want to avoid. Um, in you know, when I look at this map, I think the uh, burden of pollution, not just energy infrastructure, but the pollution associated and high asthma rates. Um, are are an issue here, and so I just you know the the research on NOx emissions is pretty solid. Uh, I want to make sure we're also avoiding avoiding that. Yeah, and um, again, maybe I'll just chime in here before turning things back to Colin. But I know, um, you know, I think a combination of some of those air quality impacts along with, um, I think, a very robust fuel cell industry. I think a lot of our recommendations point towards use of, of fuel cells rather than combusted hydrogen. Um, and and slash, but we, we definitely, again, welcome any feedback or, or recommendations on places where um, we, we can kind of continue to tune those to make sure that we're pointing in the right direction on this front. Yeah, thanks for that. I would just say glancing at the map uh, or the visual you're showing us right now that like there's no there's no indication that that that's what you're talking about. And so, um, you know, someone glancing at for, for the first time might think, let's just blend hydrogen into these peaker plants. Fair, fair. OK, um, great. Great points all around, and I think uh, this is a good sign we'll get some good engagement on the recommendations. But Colin, back to you in the meantime. Thanks, Aaron. So going into more detail about the infrastructure um, pieces that we've discussed in the past, um, past presentations have focused on sort of uh, four um, components of the hydrogen supply chain. Um, transportation, storage, compression, and then liquefaction, all of which are important pieces um, potentially to incorporate into Connecticut's own infrastructure development within the state based on need. So going into a bit more detail on each of those elements uh, in terms of transport, there are a handful of ways to transport hydrogen um, to final end users um, under stable demand uh, conditions where uh, you're trying to transport high volumes. Uh, pipelines tend to be the most economic form of hydrogen delivery. Um, in terms of high volumes, we're uh, specifically met, looking at volumes greater than 150 metric tons of delivered hydrogen per day. Um, other forms of truck deliver of delivery, such as truck delivery, can be competitive um, for smaller uh, volumes or for applications beyond the reach of hydrogen supply pipelines. In terms of storage, um, in for large scale hydrogen storage, uh, some of the best options include storage of hydrogen underground, particularly in salt caverns, um, due to their low permeability and their ability to handle high pressures. There is also the ability to store hydrogen in uh, individual 
uh, units, compressurized containers um, uh, uh, at lower volumes, but at higher volumes, uh, underground storage tends to significantly decrease the cost of storage per unit of hydrogen stored. Um, compression is another important component. Um, hydrogen produces usually uh, produce at low pressures and needs to compre be compressed to higher uh, pressures in order to be economically transported, either via pipeline or uh, via truck. Um, and then liquefaction is another uh, potential component of this hydrogen supply chain for uh, particularly truck delivery um, or delivery via rail or ship. Um, liquid hydrogen sometimes being des desirable compared to gaseous hydrogen um, because it allows you to fit essentially a lot more hydrogen into a smaller space, uh, although there are associated energy costs um, and infrastructure needs uh, to develop uh, this capability. Uh, there's a hand from Nikki. Yes, Nikki. Hi, Colin. I just had a question under the transport bullet. Um, did we consider at all any other sort of uh, forms of transportation, whether it be barge or rail? Those were two that came to mind. Um, or is that part of the, is that going to ultimately be part of the recommendations as something that needs to be looked at if we're doing kind of all encompassing looks at all methods? I'd say the latter. I don't know that we specifically called out barge and rail as possibilities, but you're right. They are certainly ways to deliver hydrogen. Um, we focus largely on um, pipelines and trucks because they tend to be some of the more flexible options, but we can definitely make sure that that is included in uh, ultimate recommendations for uh, Connecticut to look into when they do more detailed analysis on, on potential delivery methods. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, and I can put some comments to that in the report, but just especially since we have the coastline and there's also some, I believe it's either DOE or under the IIJA for port, um, you know, uh, upgrades, dollars associated with that, that maybe there's something there, but um, thank you for that. Of course, no problem. All right, well, if there's no other hands, I'll move on. Um, just going a bit more deeper on some of the questions of storage and also relation to existing infrastructure. So the development of a large scale hydrogen economy um, would likely require deployment of um, the four different types of hydrogen uh, infrastructure um, at scale. So looking at ways to produce, store, transport and deliver hydrogen effectively. Um, pipelines and at scale storage and salt domes can significantly reduce the cost of transporting and storing hydrogen compared to on road transportation. And. Uh, but to develop infrastructure of this scale, you would uh, really only do it if you had a uh, level of demand within the state that could justify that type of infrastructure development. Um, otherwise, the cost per unit delivery would simply be too high. Um, so ways to uh, potentially reduce the need for this type of infrastructure um, could be co-locating hydrogen in production and demand uh, to reduce the need for connecting pipelines um, or even combining clean energy feedstocks uh, like wind and solar um, to create a uh, more constant production profile for clean hydrogen uh, so that you can supply off takers that need a constant supply of hydrogen uh, without necessarily um, depending on or needing to tap into large scale uh, hydrogen storage. Um, but in turn, uh, to the extent that large scale hydrogen storage is needed, um, as mentioned before, salt caverns uh, provide some of the uh, lowest cost ways to store this bulk hydrogen the nearest salt caverns that would be accessible to Connecticut are likely in um, western New York or Pennsylvania. Um, if integrated into a regional hydrogen network, um, accessing these caverns is certainly not without the uh, outside the realm of possibility, and there could be opportunities to leverage existing right of ways for uh, pipelines in the state, gas pipelines in the state to develop this uh, hydrogen based network. Um, you can see uh, some of the major uh, pipeline routes uh, in Connecticut and the uh, picture in the bottom left. Um, and Colin, I think we got a question actually on the last slide, the previous slide about um, cost estimates for, for some of these different options. And also maybe um, you can speak to uh, the way that we're thinking about these kinds of research elements in terms of um, creating transparency about sort of the, the toolkit and types of infrastructure that will be needed for hydrogen versus 
um, coming up with specific recommendations about what what we're um, expecting the state to do with with these different options. Absolutely. So the first question actually sets me up really well for the slide after um, the slide that I just presented, um, talking about some of the costs for this connecting infrastructure, um, which can vary significantly with volume and distance. Here are some general high level cost estimates developed by um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which provide a really um, uh, helpful insight into some of the solutions that might be employed for different purposes in Connecticut. Um, so uh, going kind of top to bottom, uh, transmission pipelines are really uh, a very cost effective way of transporting hydrogen when you're looking at transporting very large amounts of hydrogen over 100 tons a day over very long distances. Uh, in Canada's, Canada, Connecticut's case, that would likely um, be required to connect uh, the state to um, underground storage out of state, um, but likely not needed for um, in-state delivery. Um, in-state delivery could likely be accomplished by distribution pipelines, um, specifically to concentrated end users like ports or industrial facilities that can support the level of demand needed to justify a distribution pipeline. Um, then uh, trucking delivery uh, could be an effective solution for distribution to more distributed end users like fueling stations or critical facilities that would use that hydrogen as a source of backup power. Um, you can see some of the uh, cost ranges for this infrastructure um, in this graphic. Um, in some cases, some of these costs might uh, stack on top of each other. If you have trucks pulling hydrogen from a distribution pipeline at an industrial facility, you know, you would have to incorporate both the costs of those pipelines and the trucks. Um, and also, uh, I think it's relevant to point out that uh, the goals of this working group were really only to develop some high level estimates of what some of the major infrastructure pieces and potential costs can be in order to develop a detailed cost estimate for the state of Connecticut would require a much more detailed study in terms of distances that uh, pipelines or trucks would be required to travel in terms of locations and relative volumes of production and offtake at different areas uh, in terms of the locations that these pipelines would be moving through um, and understanding the permitting requirements, uh, the cost of building in more densely populated areas, and of course, um, the importance of uh, getting community buy-in and uh, working in coordination with the communities that these infrastructure developments would be proposed in. Um, I think that that probably answered uh, the majority of the question, though I, I believe there was a second part, Aaron, and so let me know if I was, uh, if there's uh, any omissions there. I think um, I think that was helpful, though, Sh though Shannon, please feel free to um, speak up if uh, there were pieces of your question that did not get answered. Okay, sounds like we're good. Um, I'll also point out that this graphic um, looks at liquid organic hydrogen carriers as a method of truck delivery. We didn't specifically look at that in our analysis because these are uh, um, less commercially available technologies, um, but liquid hydrogen is a, is a very viable substitute for those particular technologies and, and assumably similar in cost. And now looking at uh, sort of the uh, relevance of this infrastructure um, and the cost of this infrastructure to the um, supply and use of hydrogen in the state of Connecticut. Uh, you see here um, a plot of the hydrogen supply and demand curves that were developed uh, as part of the uses and uh, sources uh, working groups respectively, um, kind of plotted against each other. So the orange line shows the amount of hydrogen that we required for different end uses. Um, and the cost, the price that that hydrogen would need to be delivered at in order to be competitive against existing fossil fuels. The blue line uh, plots the supply of hydrogen from different resources, uh, solar, onshore, offshore wind, um, and the price at which it could be produced at the point of production. Um, this uh, particular chart, um, uh, it, there is to get the full full detail, um, 
uh, I would um, recommend uh, attending the uses and, and sources working group tomorrow for the purposes of infrastructure. The key takeaway here is that um, there is a substantial uh, um, amount of uh, hydrogen that could be produced at uh, around uh, two to three dollars per kilogram from uh, clean energy sources like onshore wind, offshore wind, solar and potentially nuclear. Um, and there's a substantial amount of uh, opportunity for hydrogen to replace high priced fossil fuels like diesel or bunker fuel. Um, the higher parts of the orange line are really those applications that are utilizing those higher cost transportation fuels. And so if the cost of infrastructure for hydrogen can be kept uh, within the that gap you see between the hydrogen production price and the hydrogen price parity points, then hydrogen would uh, conceivably be able to compete against these incumbent fossil fuels uh, on an economic basis. Now you'll see there's a number of uh, parts of the orange line uh, that fall underneath the, the blue line. These are largely end uses that would utilize hydrogen as a replacement for natural gas. In this case, the high cost of natural gas, or sorry, the low cost of natural gas make it particularly difficult for hydrogen to compete, um, even when produced at low prices and delivered at low infrastructure costs. In these cases, uh, hydrogen use would likely be driven by decarbonization targets and the ability for hydrogen to be a more cost effective decarbonization solution than the uh, most likely alternative for hard to electrify or hard to decarbonize end uses. I'll pause here to see if there are any questions um, before I get into some of the uh, draft recommendations that we wanted to make sure we left time to review with everyone. Um, if there's nothing, I'll go ahead and move through to draft recommendations. So the draft recommendations for um, this particular working group um, are not necessarily are not as numerous as some of the other working groups, but they're very important um, and uh, are worth taking some time to to look into and dig into a bit more deeply. Um, this is uh, the most um, in-depth recommendation in the report related to infrastructure. It's a uh, of focused on um, having deep lead interstate and e interagency coordination to develop a hydrogen roadmap and strategy that identifies approaches to a clean hydrogen backbone that would enable the cost effective and scaled transport of hydrogen within the state, as well as other research and infrastructure investment opportunities that would inform uh, policy development funding and R&D strategy. And this would all be done in cons consultation with ecosystem stakeholders. This is really the more detailed analysis that was mentioned earlier on in this presentation, where there's a greater focus on identifying the exact costs of uh, potentially the exact cost of uh, hydrogen uh, delivery in the state of Connecticut um, based on uh, production and demand and the relative distances uh, from uh, for uh, delivering hydrogen um, across the state. Um, so we look at a current technologies available for hydrogen transport, um, including looking at the potential to use hydrogen pipelines or alternatively using electrical transmission to transmit renewable energy to uh, different uh, consumption sites, uh, which would then produce hydrogen on site uh, using that transport electricity. Um, looking at the role of hydrogen transport costs and the overall delivered cost for hydrogen in the region, and then looking at some of the cost and funding mechanisms that could be used to enable the development of infrastructure and production of hydrogen at a cost that would be competitive with fossil fuels. Um, and then, you know, this roadmap would also be designed to ensure that uh, there's full alignment with state policies and goals and alignment with the regional hub activities. So I'll pause here to see if there are any comments on uh, this particular recommendation. Mm 
All right, well, not hearing any, I'm going to continue on to the second set of recommendations. These are also um, where DEEP is identified as the most appropriate um, agency to enact these recommendations. Um, in this case, we're looking at investigating the need for hydrogen fueling stations that could support the development of uh, and use of hydrogen across a number of different transport sectors and coordinating with the Connecticut Department of Transportation to develop more specific strategies for optimizing the sizing um, and location of those uh, fueling stations as well as funding for those fueling stations. Uh, this could include an assessment of major transit routes to determine uh, which refueling locations uh, would best serve regional transit needs, um, which is something I've heard uh, uh, discussed as a, some being important um, in past working groups and conversations I've had with stakeholders. In addition, the, the uh, last recommendation for this working group um, uh, is asking DEEP to uh, a work to clarify and then a work with relevant agencies and stakeholders to explore uh, an acceleration of permitting for hydrogen infrastructure. This would be helpful to scale development at the speed needed to transition to a clean economy. Um, although it's important to ensure that uh, these permitting requirements are transparent and readily understood by all stakeholders. Um, one example of this type of effort is, took place in California, where the governor's office of business and economic development uh, published a hydrogen station permitting guidebook to streamline the process of permitting hydrogen fueling stations. Hey, hey, Colin, I think we've got a question in the chat, or excuse me, a, a hand raised. Shannon, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just on the acceleration of permitting, um, I definitely agree that that would need to be transparent um, and understood by stakeholders. But I would also suggest the establishment of some guardrails to ensure that um, you know, any projects are not resulting in adverse impacts on communities or the environment, uh, which is always a concern with um, waivers and, and other accelerated permitting processes. Thanks. Yes, that's definitely an important caveat. And maybe um, one way to make sure that that's recognized in the recommendation is to include in this one that this you know, accelerated permitting framework would be developed in coordination with uh, community stakeholders and other ecosystem stakeholders, um, similarly to, to the language in the recommendation for the uh, state hydrogen plan. Uh, what, does that sound like it would um, go towards the, the type of adjustment you're uh, kind of imagining? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think adding some language to the effect that stakeholders would be involved in development of that policy would be helpful. Uh, but I, I personally would also appreciate having some language, you know, specifically referencing the need to have appropriate guardrails to avoid adverse impacts. Got it. We'll definitely take note of that and make sure it's uh, um, worked into the final report. Any other uh, hands raised or questions in the chat? Nope. Unless anybody well, wants case. to raise their hand now. All right, looks good. All right, well, then I'll move through to next steps um, where we'll review some of the upcoming task force milestones that are important for the um, uh, remainder of this um, effort by the task force. So this week and the end of last week um, will uh, feature the, the final working group meetings for all the five working groups that were part of the task force, uh, funding and policy and workforce development uh, last week, and then sources and uses will meet in a joint meeting tomorrow um, at 1 p.m. Um, the draft final report for the task force was distributed last Friday for stakeholder review. Um, we would appreciate uh, providing all feedback on that final report um, by the end of this week. 
um, at noon Eastern time. Um, recognize that that is a, a short timeline, but um, in order to make sure that we have enough time to submit the final report in uh, to the legislature in the middle of, of January, um, uh, where we're working to make sure that uh, we can incorporate as many, much feedback as possible and, and getting the feedback um, back a couple weeks earlier is very, very important for us to be able to do that. So following the submission of stakeholder feedback on the 23rd, um, we'll distribute a final report text to the task force on January 6th. Um, so that at the January 10th task force meeting, we can have a vote out on the final report and the recommendations contained within it, um, then uh, sending the report to the legislature uh, on January 15th, um, according to statute. Um, and just one brief thing I, I do want to note here for folks. Um, so Colin ran us through some of the, the recommendations that are most relevant to the work of the, the infrastructure working group from these past couple of months. But of course, um, I'm sure folks are aware that there are a number of other recommendations which we've been um, you know, take, taking feedback on in the funding policy workforce development um, working groups for the past couple of weeks. The, this meeting and the uses and sources meeting tomorrow are our last work group meetings of the year. So um, this is a great time for folks to, to let us know if they have any thoughts or feedback for us to incorporate. Um, some of the comments that we've gotten today have been extremely helpful, but um, we, are, we are very much open to any uh, suggestions that folks have. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone shout out or raise their hand or drop anything into the chat. Um, so I just want to remind folks doors open, but otherwise, um, Colin, back to you for the regularly scheduled programming. Excellent. So this is the last slide, just final, uh, final reminder of the schedule for working group meetings. Um, we just discussed this in the last slide, but we are in the, uh, this is the final working group uh, set of working group meetings um, for the task force. Um, the final final working group being the uses and sources combined working group, which is scheduled to take place tomorrow at 1 p.m. So everyone on this call is welcome to join that as well. If you'd like more context, anything discussed here, or are just generally interested in understanding and seeing the recommendations uh, in, connected to those uh, working groups in particular. Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, if there are no other comments at this time, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we left it enough time for uh, any discussion on the recommendations um, that might have been needed. But if it looks like we're, uh, there's no other discussion at this time, we're happy to end the meeting early, uh, give everyone back some time in their day. And uh, if anyone has any thoughts or uh, comments after this meeting, you're more than welcome to reach out directly or submit them directly in the report uh, in the comments that will be uh, reviewed um, when they're uh, at, uh, this Friday um, to be incorporated in the final report. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Um, have a great holiday season, and I appreciate your uh, engagement through this process. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, folks. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.